Hello, everyone, and welcome for attending the GBeta Opportunity Zones Capital Accelerator Pitch Night. Thank you for being here, either virtually or in person. I encourage you to take lots of pictures and get loud on social media. You can engage with us at GBeta Startups or using the hashtag GBeta Pitch Night. GBeta is a generator program. Generators platform connects the creative community, including startup founders, investors, universities, corporations, musicians, and artists. This event and this program couldn't have been possible without the sponsorship and partnership of the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. Please give them a round of applause. Also, I want to give a big shout out to Civico, who allowed us to have our event in this wonderful space. For those who doesn't know me, my name is Vanessa Huerta, and I am the director of the GVEDA Opportunity Zones Capital Accelerator Program. I come from Mexico, and I moved to Denver in 2013 with my husband, Luis, and my two sons, Luis and Mauricio. I feel blessed to be part of the Colorado community, and I want to personally thank all of you for being here tonight and celebrating with me these five wonderful companies. So what is GBeta? GBeta is a business accelerator program that is free and is designed for early stage startups that are local and scalable. We select five companies to go through the cohort, and during six weeks, they participate in weekly team meetings, lunch and learn sessions where they meet special speakers and mentor swarms. A mentor swarm is a session where they get to meet five different mentors in one night. And we host six one of those during seven week programs. During investor swarm, they meet and pitch to investors, not only local, but national. GBeta's mindset is locals investing in locals. We have more than 20 programs running across the country, and every program that joins our GBeta family expands our network. For example, if you take the program here in Colorado, you get to meet people and share resources with people in Alabama, Houston, Wisconsin, or any other place that's here in the slide. We have key metrics to measure our success. GBeta's goal is that one third of the companies that go through the program either gets accepted to an equity-based accelerator or raises $50,000 or more within the first 12 months of graduating from the program. Also, another uh, goal is to get acquired. To date, 47% of GBeta alumni have achieved our goal. Since 2018, 634 startups have gone through GBeta, creating 2,838 jobs and raising over 300 million in growth capital. But all of this couldn't have been possible without any of you. So now I'm going to mention a few categories of people. And if it applies to you, please stand up. If you were a G-Beta mentor to this cohort, or if you've been a G-Beta mentor in the past, please stand up. If you are a G-Beta alum, or you're going through this cohort, please stand up. 
if you are our sponsor or you work at OEDIT, please stand up. <laughs> if you are generator staff, please stand up. And I want to give a special thanks to Jess Mavis, Gisela Ortega, and Bailey Evans for all of their help today and throughout the seven weeks. Thank you. So just as it takes a village to raise a child, it also takes a community to build a startup. Thank you to all of you for being here. Now I'm going to invite to the stage Jack Thibault, uh, Opportunity Zones Program Manager at OEDIT. Please, Jack. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so if you all recall back to December when we were all interviewing you, um, one phrase that was continuously repeated by Vanessa uh, was that you get what you put into this program. And uh, I think I, I can say, and Vanessa can confirm, that uh, you put a lot into this and you're, you're seemingly getting a lot out of it. So uh, that has definitely proven true. Um, what she didn't tell you is that the equation isn't that simple. It's not just you get what you put in, you get what you put in, and then that's multiplied by what Vanessa and what Generator puts in. And I can tell you, and Vanessa knows, she put a whole lot into this. So thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Accelerator participants. Uh, I know this was a uh, a long seven weeks. It's crazy to think where the world was seven weeks ago, uh, let alone where you all were uh, as as businesses. So uh, we we've all come a long way, and uh, it's just been, it's been really uh, great. It's I look forward every Friday to getting the updates from Vanessa on uh, all the awesome things you're doing and connections you're making. And um, it's clear that you know what has happened in the last seven weeks. It doesn't end here. It's gonna continue for, for months and years beyond today. Um, speaking from OEDIT's perspective, uh, this is not something that uh, state economic development organizations uh, normally do. Uh, we, we like tax credits, we like grants, uh, we like things that are kind of uh, a little bit easier to quantify and and to uh, you know talk to legislators about and all that stuff. Um, so this is new, and we took a bit of a risk uh, by kind of starting this program up. And uh, it's it's been really great to see that the model that we're we're hoping can spread uh, beyond Colorado has been proven successful already. Uh, so you all made us look good. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and then beyond that, of course, the, you know, the main goal of this program was to have an economic impact in these economic, economically distressed opportunity zones. And uh, you know, that's really kind of the bottom line for us from our perspective. And it's so clear that um, you know, beyond just jobs created and again, the things that economic development organizations like to quantify you all are having a huge impact, a social impact. Uh, it's not just making money and growing. Um, you're, you're really making Colorado better for, for what you've done. Um, so thank you and congrats on all your hard work and, uh, and the, the fruits of your labor. I'm really excited to see how the, how the pitches turn out and, and all, that has, uh, all that has changed over these seven weeks. So thank you all. Thank you, Jack. OK, so following, we are going to invite Jen Landers, director, executive director of Civico, to give us a few words. Please, Jen. Thank you, Vanessa. And uh, welcome, everybody, to Civico. I am so excited you're in our space. This is a space developed for community gathering. And as we come to life in community events, I'm thrilled to have you here. Welcome to those of you who are joining us virtually as well. Civico is a nonprofit that's dedicated to developing, empowering, and activating community-centered leaders. And we have programs that range across generations from as early as high school with our program with Colorado Young Leaders 
through our Governor's Fellowship Program. Luis Suarte is a alumni of that fellowship program. And in all of our programs across our nonprofit, we really try to empower people to make Colorado stronger. Jack said, you know, OEDIT in other states don't do the things that they're doing here today, empowering leaders and entrepreneurs like yourself. And that's because we do things different in Colorado, right? Uh, thank you for nodding your head because we do. And um, I'm proud of that. And I'm proud to be part of an organization that does all we can to lift up and empower our state. Um, since Vanessa so kindly gave me the mic, it also gives me the chance to just do a pitch for our Governor's Fellowship Program. It engages uh, highly experienced leaders in the state to understand and learn about the biggest issues and opportunities in Colorado over a nine-month fellowship, engages them in solving problems at a state level, and introduces them to leaders where they can really um, learn from the thought leaders and make a difference. Our applications are open through March 18th, and I welcome each one of you to see See what that program is about and if you're interested please let me know we have some information at the back for those of you who are here in person and for those who are joining virtually um, you can find that at our website at livecivico.org um, i'm really excited to listen to the pitches today and hopefully i have the chance to connect with some of you afterwards so thank you for all you're doing Thank you, Jen. And again, thanks to Civico for allowing us to be here. So now, the moment we've all been waiting for, we're going to receive our five companies from the G-Beta Opportunity Zone Capital Accelerator Program. We're going to start with Alluvia Packraft. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mariana Ceballos. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alluvia. Of Alluvia. <laughs> we make lightweight, packable, inflatable boats for casual paddlers who want to include water sports into their outdoor activities. 3% of our profits go towards programs that will make the outdoors a more inclusive, diverse, and safe space for everyone. Alluvia was recently selected as one of the uh, 10 candidates for the Musjo Accelerator and uh, outdoor-specific mentoring program guided by IceLab at the Western Colorado University. Have you ever thought about getting a kayak or a stand-up paddleboard, but you're concerned about not having enough space? I was born in a big city in Peru and moved to Colorado after college. I immediately fell in love with the outdoors, but I lived in a small apartment and I didn't have much space for outdoor gear, especially not for bulky watercrafts. I didn't even have a car to move things around. Thus, we came up with Alluvia. Our lightweight packable boats roll down to the size of a paper towel and they weigh as little as four pounds to be easily carried everywhere. They are made from premium TPU, which is the same material used for white water pack rafts. That means that you will be safe while enjoying the water. One of our pack rafts is big enough to fit you and some gear and even a toddler or a dog. And they can pack so small that you can fit them in a 20 liter backpack. Inflation is a cinch. A small rechargeable pump can inflate our boats in under two minutes. Uh, that means less stress and more time to enjoy the scenery. And people love them. Our beginner boat is for sale for $649, and we also have an intermediate and advanced boat. We currently have them for sale on our website, and we're in the process of partnering with small outdoor retailers and outdoor programs. Since our launch in September, we've reached over 4,000 accounts on social media. We've received over 2,000 page views on our website, and we've generated an initial revenue of over $4,000. We've been featured on the Deming Entrepreneur Magazine, Action Hub, Shout Out Colorado, and in the blog of the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. We also participated on Startup Colorado's Founder Competition on Q3 of 2021. Alluvia will initially target 1.40 million outdoor participants in the Denver and Austin metro areas. 
that have an annual household income uh, above the median, resulting in a serviceable addressable market of $90.9 million. From there, we will expand to the 49.10 million outdoor participants in major uh, urban markets in the United States, um, resulting in a total addressable market of $3.2 billion. A little bit about us. I have over six years of experience in sales and marketing. I have a business degree in um, Peru's most prestigious business school, and I'm also a member of the Outdoor Recreation Coalition of the Grand Valley. My co-founder, Mike, has six years of experience of owning and growing his own software development company, and he's a former outdoor uh, educator. So now our ask. We are looking for tactical advice for people in the outdoor industry that have experience on selling products direct to consumer. And also we're looking to grow our uh, network, especially in marketing and sales. Now with COVID, people are looking to spend more time outside. The uh, beginner novice outdoor market is usually not like, usually outdoor companies not, don't focus on this big market. So there's this great opportunity for us to introduce a product that will reduce the barriers of entry for paddling sports. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions. And one more thing. <laughs> We need your vote for the Musio Accelerator. There's only four spots and 10 candidates. So please vote for us. You can either use the code. Uh, you also can meet us in our booth and we'll help you with the voting. And for those in the chat, the link is right there. So please go ahead and click and vote for us. Thank you. Uh we're going to see if the audience has a question for Aluvia. Anyone? Question? We do have a question from online. The first question online is... Jess, next to you, there's a question. <laughs> we have a question right here. Can you tell me about your competition? Like, what else is out there? Because I have an inflatable kayak, so I'm kind of curious, like, what the what your differentiation point is. I'm glad you brought that up because our competitors are actually like the watercraft that people who are beginners or novices in the water sports will use. So that being said, it will be inflatable kayaks, stand up paddle boards, hard shell kayaks, and there's multiple brands in each of these categories. So there's a lot of competitors that we have, but we want to leverage the packability and lightweight of this product and introduce it to this market. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have a virtual question. So what is the next product you're going to expand to? Is paddleboard, are paddleboards on the roadmap? So paddleboards are not on the roadmap. The reason why is because there's already too many competitors out there. And also, if you consider how packable a, a, a paddleboard is compared to a, a, one of our boats, uh, there's like a substantial difference there. So we might instead go for river, like products oriented for water sports, like for example, a paddle, a pump, or maybe even uh, apparel, but we are not going into the standard paddleboard market. Any more questions? Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Too small, you know. Get over it. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here tonight. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Felipe Vieira. I'm one of the co-founders for also Adventure Meals. We are a uh, outdoor food and beverage company with the mission to diversify the outdoors through delicious, spicy, and culturally authentic Latin-inspired uh, food. And so we'll get started. Um, we. Um, tapped into, um, we tapped into, uh, in the last six months, a, a huge gap in the market. Um, and where it all started, um, it started on a backpacking trip, uh, with Dom, uh, it, um, well, let me backtrack where it all started was in Michoacan, Mexico, where I'm originally from. And a lot of the, the meals, uh, that we have here are inspired by, and it was on a backpacking trip here in the Rockies. Um, that we came up with also adventure meals. We were 15 miles into the hike 
and we were exhausted. We were on a hike outside of Leadville and got started a little too late. And we were both super hungry and I had brought some legacy meals uh, for, for us to try. It was Dom's first backpacking trip. So I was curious to see what he would think of the meals. And we uh, started eating this beef stroganoff and it was bland. It was, it was not what we were hoping for. And it just hit us. It made, made us realize that there was, uh, there was a lack of diversity in the food options in the outdoor space. These, these meals weren't speaking to us. And we just started reminiscing about uh, our abuelita, our, our grandmother's cooking from Mexico. Uh, we grew up with pozole uh, and huevos rancheros for, for breakfast uh, and giant platters of enchiladas for, for dinner. Um, that's actually a picture of my, uh, my grandma. Um, and we just started um, the entire way back, just started talking about this vision, this dream that we had for better tasting, flavorful meals in the outdoor space. And a year later, uh, we're happy to say and very grateful to say that we launched a Kickstarter that was successful with over $20,000 uh, of, of folks that pledged, uh, folks that believed in us. Um, we also came in third place at the Denver Startup Week uh, pitch competition, the BIPOC pitch competition, and also secured our first uh, brick and mortar retail partner in Farrell, which is based in Denver and also Idaho Springs. Um, and also are in the running for the Moose Jollocks uh, brand, outdoor brand accelerator program. So, so please vote for, for both Aluvia and I are, and uh, also, and so, um, but you know, what, what is the problem? What are we trying to solve for and why do we exist? Um, we exist because when you walk into an outdoor retailer and in, into an outdoor shop, uh, you don't, you know, there are zero culturally authentic meals available. Um, and for a growing, uh, diverse um, uh, adventures across the country, um, there is an unmet need. And, uh, and folks are also craving more delicious, more flavorful meals. And so that is, that is why we exist. And um, in our solution are, uh, are also adventure meals. Uh, we have four meals currently. We have a huevos rancheros, a veggie enchilada bowl, a carnitas enchilada bowl, and a pozole all inspired by my abuelitas cooking from Michoacan. And uh, they're easy they're, they're easy to make. Uh, we produce everything here in Denver. And uh, they're easy to make. All it takes is five minutes of boiling water and putting it into the bag. You can have these meals when you're out in the wilderness or if you're car camping or backpacking. Um, again, it all, all it takes is water. And they are incredibly delicious. And we are not stopping there. Uh, so product development. So yes, we launched four delicious meals this past year, but we're also excited to uh, launch Oso Bites, which are going to be tropical dehydrated fruit snacks with a little spice on them. Um, and then we're also going to have instant coffee, Oso Cafe. So with cinnamon, vanilla, sugar, it's going to be really, really good. Um, and then this is our revenue model. So we have four uh, ways that our customers can engage us. One of them is the subscription. The other one is USDA backed government contracts. And what we're really excited there is that we're going to be able to provide culturally diverse snacks to uh, youth, um, especially 95% of them are youth of color amongst Denver public schools. The next is a bundle of four. So you can uh, get a variety of meals. And then the last is a la carte. So you can just select what you want. Um, so in Colorado, there are about 3.9 million people that go and access the, the outdoors. Um, and for Oso, that's uh, representing a 3.7 billion opportunity here in Colorado alone. This number is a little lower um, because we know that not everybody uh, purchases food, but there are the different categories from meals to snacks and, and then coffee. And we're really excited about the coffee. It's, that's just instant. Regular coffee, of course, would be way higher, but this is instant. So there's a huge opportunity to grow there. Um, and then how do we accelerate? So this has been a very grassroots movement. Uh, Felipe and I come from an organizing background and we were able to just get introduction networks um, and be able to just keep this going. And so we would love to you all to either follow us on social media, open up other opportunities, but that's where we want to see ourselves um, accelerate. And then this is the team. So uh, we come all from a diverse background. Uh, most recently, myself, uh, Marcos, we founded the Colorado Food Cluster, which provides free meals to 12,000 kids home delivery every week. And so we're really excited to bring that knowledge into Osa Mills for distribution, supply chain, and all that good stuff. But this is the unique team. We're really excited to grow Oso. 
Um, but thank you so much. And we're excited for hopefully all you to try our delicious, tasty, spicy meals. Any questions from the audience? Okay, we'll take one from online. Okay, you have three offerings on your website right now. What are the next couple of flavors you're going to launch? That's a surprise. I can't tell you all that. Uh -uh, <laughs> nope, that's a secret. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just joking. Uh, we haven't thought about it too much. Or we want to expand it to other varieties too. So outside of Latin food themes, but we're open to ideas. So if you have any suggestions, uh, send them our way. Amazing. Any questions from the audience? Yes. How, you said everything's produced in Denver. Do you have a co-packer here too? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have a co-packer, uh, Base Camp. So we got all our ingredients shipped here in Denver, and then they made it all. And then we just picked up, um, as we scale, we're going to have to figure out the diffusion. But we got his Chevy legs to make it happen. And we, we also have some really exciting potential partnerships. So in the Western neighborhood, there is this community organization called Revision. And so they grow their own uh, cr uh, crops. And so they also have ghost kitchens for uh, aspiring entrepreneurs. And so they are looking to buy a freeze dryer and also a dehydrator for community use and want to partner with us. And so that would be amazing to be able to source our ingredients uh, locally. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amy Rainey, and I am the founder and head fund maker at Spindrift Sandboards. We are the premier place for visitors to rent sandboards and sand sleds for use at the Great Sand Dunes National Park, located in beautiful southern Colorado. Upon moving to the San Luis Valley, I noticed that there were no rental shops on the way into the sand dunes from the eastern portion of the valley. So in the spring of 2018, I took my tax return, I bought my first sand boards, and I started renting them out of a local hotel as a value-added service. Then in 2019, we moved into our brick-and-mortar location in the heart of Blanca, Colorado. Since 2019, we have experienced 125% growth every year since, grossing over $95,000 in 2021. Upon further research, I discovered that there were only two sandboard manufacturers in the whole United States. The problem is, is these manufacturers are making boards out of wood. Wood is not a sustainable product. They also make boards with carbon fiber, which is very expensive and not friendly to the environment. The thing is, we got to quit cutting down trees to make sandboards. So that's why we are creating sandboards fabricated from hemp and bamboo for our decks. Our customers will have the opportunity to come either purchase a st stock sandboard or they can have it customized with killer graphics. They will have many styles and shapes to choose from and they can either purchase them directly in our rental shop or online. Currently, we have seasonal revenue from our sandboard rentals and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but what we're looking at as sorry, I lost my place, guys. <laughs> so we're killing it with the seasonal revenue, right? The thing is, is that this season, we are going to start selling sandboards in our rental shop, giving our customers the option to either rent a board for $20 a day or purchase their own board. Rentals generated that $95,000 last year. Not to mention, 
this happened during a worldwide pandemic, validating that there is a high demand for sandboarding equipment. Also, it has been announced that sandboarding is going to become an Olympic sport in 2024. Woo! And the Great Sand Dunes is one of the four candidates for hosting the 2028 Olympics. So we're all hoping for that. So there were last year an estimated 46 million visitors to the top five sand sport destinations. If each one of those customers rented a $20 board from us, we would have a total addressable market of $920 million. As we and venture into manufacturing, we'll increase that total addressable market by one to $1.3 billion. I have to tell you guys, I'm really stoked. We actually just acquired our commercial property within our opportunity zone. Excuse me, I keep pushing the wrong button, I apologize. As the home of our rentals, our retail, and our manufacturing. Excuse me. I am asking, though, that each one of you make any introductions you may have to partners, suppliers, and potential customers to come our way. I finally got ourselves on social media, and um, I ask that you guys take an opportunity to also like us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. So a little bit about me. I uh, grew up in Colorado, and I started working in the dental industry when I was the age of 12. Then in my 20s, I mean my 30s, excuse me, I transitioned into being a construction project manager. I, while attending college, worked in a high-end cabinet shop, and I learned the ins and outs of design of high-end custom cabinetry. I am also the proud owner of SLV Property Services, and I'm a yoga instructor at our local community center. We at Spindrift are always looking for key members to add to our team as we continue to grow and thrive, creating a culture where employees can be engaged, they can be productive, and they can be proud of what they're doing. Our vision is to create a company that will bring sustained economic development and growth to our underserved community. By creating skilled jobs and bringing more tourism dollars to our area, we hope to build a better community that's a great place to live, work, and play. Thank you for your time and attention to my presentation. I'll open up the floor to questions. Awesome. So you have a question from our online viewers. So is Great Sand Dunes National Park the only place that I can sandboard or are there other places in the United States? There are actually currently 43 other sandboarding destinations within the United States. And there is opportunities throughout the world to sandboard in Chile, Peru, uh, Dubai, Australia, there's tons of sandboarding opportunities. So this sport has a great potential to have exponential growth. Awesome. Any questions from the audience? Yes. How much does a sandboard cost? So right now, the average sandboard markets are rent, I mean, sells for between $250 and $325. Thank you. One more. I'll just be the question girl. Um, <laughs> what are the barriers to entry in sandboarding? Is it similar to surfing or do you offer lessons? So that is why I love sandboarding so much because it's accessible to everybody. Like I mentioned, we manufacture, we're going to manufacture stand up boards and sit down sleds. So the stand up thing isn't your thing, and you can always sit down on a sled and cruise that way. It's also a very affordable sport for millennials, families, and people that are just love traveling to the national parks, playing in the dunes. 
Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this way? OK. Uh, sorry, I'm coming off like a couple of months on Zoom, so I'll just ask. Can you guys see me? <laughs> All right, great. All right, my name is Nosa. Uh, happy to be presenting my company, TruckDesk, which is a compliance as a service solution for the trucking industry. All right, um, so we have a whole bunch of entrepreneurs in this room, right? And a whole bunch of people who work with entrepreneurs. So what if I was to tell you that the reason why people start businesses is because they love all the paperwork, like accounting, billing, that's the fun stuff, right? Well, not necessarily. Like no one starts their company because they enjoy doing all the paperwork, right? And think about it, right? If you own a car, imagine what comes along with owning a car. You need to make sure your license is up to date. You need to make sure your insurance is renewed every six months. You need to make sure your permits, depending on where you live, your registration, everything is up to par, right? If you own multiple cars, that problem compounds. So that starts to give you a sense of what trucking companies go through, right? Having a commercial vehicle requires a lot more compliance than a personal car. It even makes matters worse that these trucking companies are driving through 50 states and are subject, subject to regulations in different states every time. So herein lies the problem, right? It takes way too much time for trucking companies to be able to navigate the complicated world that is trucking regulation, and the cost of non-compliance is very, very high. Last year alone, the average fine paid by trucking companies for non-compliance was over $6,000. So what's our solution? We're building a platform to help trucking companies stay up to date with compliance, right? So think of it like TurboTax is to taxes. We're building a similar platform, but specifically for trucking compliance. And this is how it works. You know, you're a trucking company, you're a trucking company owner. You go there, you log in, you put in some information about your equipment, your company, things like that, and your location. And we tell you what is expiring, what you need to renew, the regulation you need to be aware of. And we keep you updated and make sure that you never fall in never become non-compliant with regulations and avoid paying those fines. And this is our revenue model. So uh, to start with, we're gonna start with a subscription, uh, 69 to $399, depending on the size of your fleet. Uh, in the medium term, there are opportunities for filing fees. You know, I wanna use truck desk as a conduit to apply for all those permits that are required of trucking companies. So we take a commission of that. And then in the long term, what we really wanna do is to provide financial services for truckers. So things like factoring and escrow services, these are financial, um, uh, these are financial needs for trucking companies to maintain cash flow. And this is our traction in the last, uh, I want to say six-ish months or so, it started with us building a free trucking calculator to help dispatchers to be able to negotiate better loads. We threw that out there and that helped us build our wait list to over a thousand trucking companies currently. Uh, we're working with three trucking companies, uh, two in Colorado and one in Kentucky. Out of those three, one is actually our first paid customer. And obviously we're in an incubator, Goji Beta. <laughs> accelerator and we're lucky enough to win uh, some money uh, late last year in a pitch competition so as far as our total addressable market uh, we calculated as being three billion um, it's important to note that the three billion is just the TAM for trucking compliance specifically uh, the trucking industry total addressable market is about 840 billion or so to almost a trillion dollars and how we arrived at this is we multiplied our average subscription by the number of trucking companies in the us which is readily available on the department of transportation website so although we're not actively fundraising we do have some asks uh first things first uh we'll love your feedback you know feedback on the pitch feedback on the product. I like talking to people who are not in the logistics industry because sometimes it brings like a different perspective to what we're doing. We we'll also love introductions to people in the logistics industry. So if you have friends or family members who own trucking companies, who are safety officers, who are in the transportation department or the logistics department of you know large retailers or who are heads of associations and things like that, we'll love introductions to those types of people. Those are our potential customers. And this is what the team looks like. That's me, <laughs> even though I don't have a lot of hair. <laughs> um, but I'm a solo founder right now. Um, I used to be an underwriter, and 80% of my former clients were truckers. I also used to be a CFO for a small trucking company here in Colorado. And prior to that, I was in commercial banking space, uh, including roles in audit and compliance. Uh, I am currently out there talking to a few potential 
co-founders, and I hope to seal the deal with one of them by the summer. And this is just a montage of what I've been up to so far. All right, so why truck desk, you may ask. If there's anything that the pandemic taught us is that supply chain is very, very important to the economy. The trucking industry is a huge part of supply chain. 74% 74, 74 of goods transported in the U.S. are transported via truck. So everything from the screens to the microphone I'm holding to the clothes you wear, most likely you were transported via truck. Truck desk is helping trucking companies stay in business with our compliance product. It's also a sizable total addressable market. I have domain expertise and I've worked with these trucking companies over time and we've demonstrated the problem through the early traction that we've generated. So to wrap up, if we all believe that time is money, we want to invite you to come help Truck Desk save the time for trucking companies. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Awesome, okay, so we have someone online watching saying, they're straight, a state trooper. He says, excellent idea. Would this help with truck and driver inspections? It will help with truck and driver inspections eventually. Another customer will be government agencies like state troopers, but not for now because we're on the side of truckers for now. And then we get to law enforcement later. Awesome. Anyone in the audience question? Okay, we have an Great presentation. Thank you. Um, what has been the biggest barrier, the biggest challenge for you up to this point? Also? Uh, up to this point, I would say, um, that's a good question. Now, I wouldn't really call it uh, a challenge. Obviously, you know, in the trucking industry, the way it's modeled, a lot of um, owner operators like, there's this thing in the trucking industry, they say if you don't drive a stick pift, you're not a real trucker, right? So people tend to, you know, be against technology a little bit. But in the last five years, we've had a little help with that. Like the Department of Transportation have been mandating more and more regulation that forces trucking companies to use technology. So the ELD mandate, which is an electronic login device mandate that was passed like I want to say like four years ago. So trucking companies are starting to understand that to manage their fleet properly they you know, need technology, they, you can't do it any other way. So I guess adoption in that sense has been somewhat of a challenge, but more and more people are starting to recognize that this is better than paying $6,000 in fines. So, you know, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Nosa. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Not this time. My name is Abby, and I am one of the co-founders of the company Zombies Footwear. Zombies is a footwear company for healthcare workers by healthcare workers, and our product is really complicated. So since 2019, first we worked on securing our intellectual property. We completed 12 different field studies to prove and improve the efficacy of our product. We've been working with... Um, the EPA for EPA distributors of our product, prototyping and manufacturing, and now we're getting to the fun part. PPE is probably not a term you were familiar with prior to 2020, if we're being honest. PPE stands for personal protective equipment. And really what that means is just physical barriers that protect you against disease. Things like gloves and masks and hand washing. One thing that you may not know is that OSHA does not give specific designation to footwear for healthcare workers. A majority of healthcare workers wear their footwear from the clinical setting home to the grocery store and on mass transit. Another thing you may not know is that each of you right now have over 400,000 different bacteria on the bottom of your shoes. And I would argue that healthcare workers come in contact with the most dangerous of them all. It's easy to look at statistical risks and think, does it really matter if I bring bacteria into my house until something happens to you or someone that you care about? I have worked in healthcare for the past 17 years. 
I'm a nurse practitioner for University of Colorado Health in emergency and family medicine. In 2019, this became personal for me. I have a child who has a chronic skin disease that makes them susceptible to infection. Uh, my son became really sick with a skin infection and his cultures came back positive for an antibiotic resistant bacteria. This isn't found in the general population. I knew it was something that I had brought home from work. My kids live on the floor. <laughs> And I started looking online for footwear that had antimicrobial properties or opportunities, and I couldn't find anything. So I decided to build it, not just for my family, but for yours too. I know you're all dying to see what this footwear looks like, and of course I want to show it to you. But we're entering a super competitive market, and we are going to keep our designs private until right before we launch. But what I can tell you is this is a very utilitarian shoe. It is going to be extremely stylish, obviously, comfortable, and it has the first ever active antimicrobial outsole. And dare I say the only one there will ever be because of our IP. So what is different about our shoes is they're embedded with copper on the outsole, which is the bottom of your shoe that touches the ground everywhere you work, everywhere you walk. Copper is a natural antimicrobial. When it comes into contact with bacteria, the bacteria die, and because they're positively charged, they go on to kill more living bacteria. We fondly refer to this as the zombie effect. Unfortunately, manufacturing in the United States right now is not cost effective for us, but we are setting up an Opportunity Zone headquarter and distribution center in the beautiful Buena Vista, Colorado. We'll be launching fourth quarter this year with our direct-to-consumer model. With a fourth quarter launch, we're actually starting our marketing campaign this summer. We want to keep our target market interested, not too early before we launch, and get them engaged because they are going to be in a post-pandemic, exhausted, disgruntled state, and we want to encourage them with a new barrier that we're bringing to the market. There are a ton of different industries that could benefit from a product like this. Initially, our focus is healthcare workers. There's 32.2 million healthcare workers in the U.S. alone. Typically, they change their footwear twice a year. That gives us a TAM of 9.96 billion. We are going for it. When we launch our first year to market, we're hoping to acquire just a half a percentage of that market, which gives us a serviceable market of $39 million. We have put together an amazing team. Um, I fondly refer to us as the band of misfits. We have healthcare workers, scientists, and footwear designers and production developers from companies like Nike, Crocs, and Merrill. If we've learned anything through the pandemic, it's that microscopic and invisible threats are real. And there are diseases that you're spreading that you can't see or feel or touch. When it comes to PPE, it's all about adding more armor onto the healthcare worker. And we're excited to bring a new shield to the market. We feel like it couldn't come at a better time than this. Thank you so much. I would be happy to answer any product questions. Okay, you have a lot of non-medical fans on Twitch right now saying that they want a pair of these. And it has sparked the question, can people other than healthcare workers use these? What other profession would they be effective in? That's a great question. And I guess my question to that is, what profession would they not be helpful in? Because this is all about decreasing the spread of disease, right? There's a lot of different professions that could benefit from this. And one thing we look at down the line is marketing to other footwear companies as well. And to be honest, we've had multiple footwear companies interested, but we want to protect our healthcare workers first, and then someday get involved with meat packing plants, airports, schools, and especially restaurants. Truckers, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, state patrol. Absolutely. Police, first responders. I mean, first responders go in and out of clinical settings and into vulnerable populations, nursing homes, people's homes. And so that's definitely a target market for us. Awesome. Any audience questions? Yeah. 
So in terms of your commercialization plan, are you planning to manufacture in-house or is this a licensing play? We are going to be the manufacturing agency working with a factory overseas. But then when they come to Colorado, we will be the main distribution center for the product. So we will create Colorado jobs. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a minute also on behalf of all the founders to thank Generator. We all feel really honored to have been chosen for a program like this, especially to Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you to you. And of course, Abby wanted to make me cry when I was about to speak. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> I'm holding it. Um, well, what a great evening. I just want to ask to the audience to give another round of applause to these uh, amazing founders. And I'm happy to announce that we're going to have a second cohort of the G-Beta Opportunity Zone Capital Accelerator Program. We're accepting applications right now, and this will be open until March 15. If you are a startup or if you know a startup that could benefit from this program, please urge them to apply or contact me at the email that you have on your screen. I would like to give a special thanks to our sponsor and partner, the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. And with this, the program ends, so please feel free to stay with us, have some food, a few drinks, and mingle with our startups. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful night.